Welcome, everyone, to another Voices with Raveki. I'm here with Rusha Modi. I'm looking forward to talking to him. He reached out to me, and we've had a previous off-camera conversation, and he uh, wanted to get in some in-depth discussion with me. And so, uh, Rusha, why don't you uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, why you reached out to me and how your work and my work uh, intersect. Yes, I just want to say, again, thank you for having me. I've been a big fan of your work, trying to keep up with it. It's very intellectually dense uh but i think what you're trying to do which is provide uh society writ large and, and all of us especially in the last couple of years with the pandemic dealing with challenges of meaning and crafting understanding mm -hmm. out of the events both internally and externally is super important uh my name is rusha modi i'm a gastroenterologist uh, here in los angeles and yeah, I was on faculty at Keck School of Medicine for many years before I transitioned to an affiliate faculty role uh, where I focus on two sort of areas of interest. One clinically is on colon cancer screening and prevention and creating systems of care that can reach out to underserved populations that have historically been excluded from sort of preventative health and public health measures. And then I'm part of the Health System Science Research Lab at the Gare Institute at USC which is focused on not only quality improvement, but healthcare policy and advocacy work to sort of revamp our system of care, which in America, for those that don't know, is still largely fee for service and not really focused on quality throughput more than outcomes. And so that's kind of been my area of interest. And personally, it's also been a very difficult time as a provider, you know, trying to deal with the dramatic upheaval in our healthcare system, especially in the last couple of years. And I was in the ICU, you know, March of 2020 mm. and they're on in as well as on the floors and in the clinics, taking care of patients. For those that don't know, since I'm an intestinal and liver doctor, most of my patients are critically ill. They're bleeding. They need endoscopies and stuff like that. So I, I reached out to you because I was definitely looking for guidance and someone to make sense of the sheer amount of just chaos that's going on and i have increasingly become more interested in advocating for people who are in, in frontline and healthcare and healing professions because there is a massive amount of underappreciated struggle even before the pandemic but accelerated because of these crises with meaning and a challenge of how to handle the modern machinery of medicine and healthcare versus this sort of science of healing and taking care of people and the art of healing people, which is what brought us into this field. And that schism is get, getting larger. And mm -hmm. that is creating a meaning gap for people, from respiratory therapists to physicians, to nurses, to occupational uh, health experts, to people who are social workers. And I hear this from a variety of providers. And I thought like, well, your work would definitely be very relevant and illuminating to physician and clinician burnout, which is, I think, going to be probably the biggest long term complication of the pandemic is just providers struggling to not only handle the clinical workload, but to craft some sense of what does this all mean? I mean, we all went through very unique interpretations of a collective trauma, mm. and that has, I think, still not fully been dissected and discussed and reintegrated into our individual and collective experiences. And I think we aren't trained to do that. We mm -hmm. aren't trained to have that kind of reflective experience. I remember, and I've told this story before, I remember the first time I lost a patient as a, as a physician out of med school as an intern. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, there was definitely a sense of this is unfortunate, but then it was on to the next one. You know, you have 20 other patients that are critically ill when you're in the hospital and there wasn't a sense of like, we need to process this and give, especially younger clinicians who are still learning the science and the art of taking care of other people, time to integrate this into what this means as providers, citizens, humans, people going through this human journey. And I see that being a real problem. And then as a last comment, I will say in my field of intestinal liver disease, we are increasingly seeing the immediacy of these deaths of despair, which is Angus uh, Deaton yeah. uh, of Princeton was commenting on, I am seeing opioid epidemics leading to intestinal issues, hepatitis, liver cirrhosis, alcohol use and abuse. 
um, intravenous drug use leading to viral spread of diseases, mental health challenges implicating in gut health. So this is directly a clinical phenomenon as much as it is sort of a social and human and psychological one. And I think these are sort of the challenges that we're struggling with because you can't medicalize a lot of this stuff. I mean, the root problem is a lack of meaning. It's a lack of being able to contextualize, interpret, you know, all the sheer rawness of what has happened in the last couple of years. And as our society becomes sicker, more comorbid, dealing with more health issues in a society, at least in America, that has got a fraying social fabric and, you know, in this sort of post-God sort of society, I think people are sort of struggling and they look to physicians and healthcare professionals, right. but we, we aren't necessarily equipped to answer those questions. Right. And it becomes sort of a difficult sort of time. The last comment I know I'm, I'm sounding off as, as the first question is that no. physicians are not allowed to speak on this publicly because if there's any implication that they are mentally and emotionally struggling too much with all of what I've just referenced, then that becomes, oh, can you even do your job? Every hospital, clinic, mm. um, credentialing form, privileges to even take care of patients in any healthcare setting, you are screened, rightfully so, for any of these things. Mm. Um, do you have any mental health issues that would limit your ability to sort of take care of providers or for patients? As a result, you know, I know a lot of providers that have to secretly handle these issues in the shadows, stealing, you know, not steal, I don't mean that literally, but like, you know, getting off label use of antidepressants without seeing a clinician in a traditional setting because they don't want that labeled on their medical chart. Like, you know, in between patient, oh, do you mind? I'm, you know, I need a little Prozac. Do you mind writing me a script, buddy? You know, a clinician, a friend that you know or a colleague. And so there's also that added level of like not being able to disclose any of it, which is tragically ironic given the nature of the work that physicians do, which is trying to heal people through their difficult moments, you know? And so it sort of brings back the physician heal thyself. We aren't allowed to, mm. because if it ever becomes dramatically, uh, if it ever becomes that clinically significant, then your livelihood and your your ability to take care of patients could be in jeopardy. In fact, there was a there was a New York Times op-ed I think earlier this year in about June. I'll send you the link uh, outlining this very thing, where physicians and clinicians are getting depressed, hyper anxious, they're confused, rightfully so given what's going on, but they aren't able to right. safely and without stigma and without financial and legal blowback easily access supportive care. And so that is adding to this sort of, this is driving down this sort of phenomenon of physicians struggling to make meaning, struggling to make sense, emotionally heal. They aren't able to get those communities that you so reference where you can make meaning together because you can't talk about it. You have to be, you know, behind closed walls or after hours or in between, you know, these little nooks and crannies of the day to sort of take care of your own issues on the side increasingly while our, our services are commoditized as sort of, you know, factory physicians. And so this has become, I think, a series of issues that have stacked upon themselves and compounded what has already been sort of difficult time. And so you see 500,000 nurses in the United States who have already retired early and or left the field yeah. since the pandemic yeah. occurred. Yeah. And that's only going to increase. And then a number of surveys that have cited at least at least two thirds of physicians in most studies uh, are actively thinking about retiring early, leaving, and or would also not recommend this field, you know, to their children. Be considering. I mean that that is a massive problem, and I'm not as familiar with the Canadian data, and obviously the healthcare system is very different there. But I have friends that work in Canadian healthcare facilities, and they're reporting anecdotally, at least, very similar challenges. And so I thought, you know, who better than yourself to at least provide some guidance to people who are like trying to make meaning out of this. And I had a friend, a physician who shall remain nameless, who just called me last week as a last comment. And he's tired. He's so career and existentially burnt out. And he says, yeah. Rusha, 
I love medicine, but I hate healthcare. Mm. And there are so many physicians, especially mid career or early career that still have 20, 30, 40 plus years potentially in this industry that are at a crossroads. You know, like I don't know how to handle this because this is not at all the system of care that I thought I was going to be inheriting to take care of patients. And they don't know how to re-identify themselves because, you know, I'm not going to compare physicians versus like other professionals, but I will say that for physicians, that decision about yes, no, do I want to become a, a physician or a nurse practitioner, that was made very early in life for the vast majority of people. There mm -hmm. are people who are in a different field and they had some important issue that transitioned them in their life to going into a different area. But the vast majority of physicians were the ones playing with stethoscopes when they were two and, you know, dressed up as doctor. Like that was something that was a central part of how they view themselves as a person and how they view the world and what their role in the world is. So for them to be, you know, in their mid to late thirties or mid to late forties, suddenly not knowing how to navigate all this, this is a crisis of meaning here. This is not simply, oh, they're working me too hard because physicians are accustomed to working hard. Yeah. And I often tell people, you know, do this thought experiment. If you were doing something that you truly loved and you felt supported by the larger political economic system of healthcare to do that, but you were working still 80 hours a week, you might be truly exhausted at the end of the week, but would you be burnt out? And most people that I talk to in healthcare say, no, mm -hmm. I would not be burnt out if I felt I was equipped to handle the modern milieu, what lack of a better term of healthcare. I would be really, really tired, but I wouldn't be burnt out. And I think the reason that burnout is more of a problem as opposed to just sheer fatigue, although that is one too, is a lack of meaning, a lack of not being able to do the work that we came into this field wanting to do, that we dedicated our lives to do. And I don't think clinicians are able to navigate that and you can't talk about it. And now, and when you talk to people outside of healthcare, you know, when you even intimate that you might wanna leave the field or you're struggling with all this, they're like, but you, you spent so much time, you've dedicated your whole life. Why would you even think about anything else? And it's like, well, you don't seem to understand. Like it's precisely because I've dedicated so much time and I care about the work that I do, that it's it's tragic that a lot of colleagues of mine and friends are, are thinking about stepping away. And so hopefully you'll be able to fix this in the next 40 minutes or whatever. <laughs> no, at least provide some guidance, because I know I've talked to a few people you know, I said, look, I'm going to be talking with this esteemed professor who's done a tremendous amount of work on on sort of crafting meaning through a variety of cognitive mm -hmm. science and sort of, um, you know, psychological lenses. And they're very interested because this, 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 this is not in the consciousness of the average healthcare provider because none of this is sort of discussed. You know, we're body technicians at this point. We're not right. healers. We're not we have encounters with consumers of healthcare. There's this lexicon of the market that has overtaken US healthcare to the extreme. And even the languaging of all of this is it's messing with our ability to think clearly about this. So that's that's kind of in broad strokes, kind of what brought me to you, um, which I'm very excited and privileged to even sit here with you virtually uh, and what got me interested in your work. And, and yeah, and that's kind of where we would start. Well, thank you, Risha. That was uh, that was uh, quite eloquent and well articulated. I just want to make sure I've got some of the salient features. Those are sort of intersecting factors. One is, and you're right, burnout is not the same thing as fatigue. Burnout is a meaning issue, and you're right to articulate those. So the 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 meaning is uh, not there in the medical profession, at least for many practitioners, uh, and so that is becoming. Um, as meaning often does, it is 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 becoming a an existential and mental health issue. Uh, so that's one thing. Um, and then that's intersecting with the fact that uh, there's a general meaning crisis and the deaths of despair are going up. And so while that's putting more pressure and giving you more sort of in the face of in your faces, you're having to face despair and you have to face uh, these lives. Uh, that are are being 
consumed by self-deceptive, self-destructive behavior. The medical profession is now existentially and mentally burnt out, so it doesn't have terrific resources of meaning in life by which it could confront <clears throat> this challenge. And in order to try and confront it, presumably there might need to be right practices for the cultivation of meaning and wisdom, but you're not allowed to bring those up because those are quickly assimilated into mental health issues that signify that you're no longer competent to be a physician. Is that basically uh, a good explanation of the problem? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I would add the sort of the, the shift in identity. I mean, yes. physicians are generally very impact oriented. We want tools to be able to affect change in a very particular way. And it's profoundly unsettling when you're not able to do that because you're not able to spend enough time with provider or with patients or they have social determinants of their health problems that you would just don't have the tools to address. Right, right. The deaths of despair, this general despair that you so eloquently talked about in a lot of your work is one of that. That That is not separate from what's happening in the clinic room. Yeah. And so we can provide, you know, pharmaceuticals and various other tools, imaging, et cetera. But we're, we're not blind to the fact that this is grossly inadequate given the scale of this problem. Right. Um, but many times it's the ER physician or nurse, or it's the primary care doctor, someone's fortunate to have one, that starts picking up on these sentinel events that clue us in that there's this larger social phenomenon. And then we start hearing experts such as yourself and these other scholars bringing this to our attention. Um, and that that becomes a challenge. So I think there's a, a sense of professional and personal impotency. But like mm. we, we can't address this in the way that we are accustomed to addressing diabetes or high blood pressure right. or right. And that sense of undermined agency and futility then exacerbates your issues. I mean, all of you collectively, your issues about why am I doing this? What? Why? How do I matter? You know, what? How am I making a difference? Uh, and what's the point of it all? Kind of thing uh, becomes pervasive. I take it. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think. That's exactly, I mean, that's a good breakdown of the core, you know, essential issues here. And I, you know, I'm, I'm desperate and fascinated and excited and anxious all at the same time to kind of hear like what, what kind of, you know, insights or directions you can kind of point us at, because I know that it's going to take a number of successive conversations with multiple yeah. thought leaders to kind of address this. I'm just excited that we're having this conversation because again it's not something that's easy to talk about in in formal medical settings and like this in my opinion again i'm just one person this is the central medical issue of facing clinicians right but you'll never see this on a conference agenda with the exception of a few maybe select medical associations this is rarely discussed in any meaningful sense and the overtures that are given by hospital administrators or medical society uh, bodies are do more yoga wellness Wednesdays, where you get an email newsletter of like, you know, fairly perfunctory and quotidian sort of yeah, yeah. minor individual things that you can do, you know, uh, to sort of relieve this stress burden when the the thousand foot perspective is that clearly this is a systematic and social issue yeah. uh, but the burden is on you well if you're not taking time for self-care well then clearly that's the solution to all this not these social factors that you know we're all privy to that we can't talk about and so you know now the burden is on us there's some implication that we're falling short like we shouldn't be so burned out if we only meditated more for 20 more minutes every day on top of the laundry list of all the things we have to do, that would, that would of course solve it. So then right. there's a sense of like, uh, not being able to be heard and validated when we're speaking out about these issues on the rare moments when we are able to speak out. And, you know, I give people and societies and institutions the benefit of the doubt, but there is a sense of like a little bit of gaslighting involved you know mm -hmm. we're not able to get validation for what we're discussing you know and that ends up being itself a challenge you know 
So I see there like there's this vicious cycle then, right? The societal thing, and then you you're you're required to respond to it, but you really don't have the tools to respond to it, and yet you're not allowed to acknowledge that you can't really respond to it, and it's taking a heavy toll on your spirit in a profound way. Um, now you 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 mentioned that this was exacerbated by COVID, but this trend had started long before COVID. When do you think? Like, do you have a sense of when it changed and when it shifted, like if we could get an understanding of a bit of the, well, the etiology of it, uh, like, do you have a sense of what there was a turn? You said there's been, and I think this was very telling and I want to slow down around it. There's been a sense of a change in identity. Um, and you mentioned that. Um, when did that shift happen and when did it become pronounced? You know, I think that's a that's a difficult question. If I had to point to sort of a time period, I, I would say probably the Nixon administration, mm. probably or around the sort of late 70s, early 80s ish, when managed care, and I'm referencing just the United States sort of phenomenon right. here. Obviously, we could do a, a discussion of comparative health systems, you know, later, but when managed care ended up being a central player, you know, and for those that don't know, managed care, private healthcare organizations and insurance uh, firms that are tasked with providing a risk pool of patients that they cover with insurance services, but therefore they have to then pay hospitals and providers for their clinical services. When that became a central stakeholder and the delivery of healthcare, then suddenly, and I don't blame them initially for wanting to do this, cost containment and shareholder value ended up becoming the central maxims by which they would reimburse for care. Right. And when you shift the incentives and in how care is delivered, that fundamentally reshapes how care is even imagined in the first place. And that was when the lexicon of the market became Right. Uh, sort of central. When that happened, then you suddenly had the only metric that truly matters, even to this day, in most healthcare facilities in the United States, whether it's the clinic down the street or quaternary medical institution associated with the university, um, is throughput. It's speed. You know, it's what we call the RVU, sort of this revenue value unit. It's how fast you can do care, how large of a volume of care that can be done. It isn't necessarily, for the most part, quality of care or more humanistic sort of ideals. So I always joke with people, you know, I guess I went to provider school, not medical school, because oh. that's the only term that is used to describe me as a provider. And patients are not patients, they're consumers. Wow. And we have a medical encounter. And when I first heard that term, I was like, you know, spies have encounters with other spies in like, <laughs> yeah. some, you know, shadowy parking garage. I mean, clinicians and doctors should not be having encounters with patients. And I'm not opposed to sort of the need for business savvy in healthcare. Obviously, when it's a ballooning budget, we have to be very critical about how dollars are used. But that was so extreme mm. that physician services ended up being accurately commoditized. And when you're a commodity, then you're bought and sold under the moniker of various healthcare organizations that package physician services. So then you had a drop in physician autonomy. You had the rise of this sort of factory model of care. The only metric that was ever really of value was throughput and the speed at which you could see patients. And that led to a dramatic shift away from alternate models of care. And even now in the last 10, 15 years when valued based care, you know, which is theoretically at least supposed to be more quality driven, uh, that still has got a long ways to go before that's taken root. So to answer your question, I, I would actually point back to probably a number of decades ago mm. when this became an issue. And then probably starting in the early to mid nineties, you had a massive wave of consolidation in most major urban metropolises of healthcare organizations. Right. Now that ended up not working, but that has now resurfaced. So in most major US city, uh, cities, uh, physicians typically have probably no more than five employers. 
Mm. Probably much less than that. Like, you know, you look at cities like Rochester, you know, in Minnesota, you, you have two employers, that's it. So when physicians have no ability to sort of interact with patients aside from major medical machineries, then it becomes much more difficult to advocate for patients in the way that you want because you're told what to do on a schedule. You're told what to do in terms of people that have non-clinical interests or shareholder values you know, at stake here. And there needs to be a balance. But there has been such a shift towards the expense of physicians and, and patients in the name of you know, financial quarter one, you know, balance sheets, profits and losses that you end up having sort of such a asymmetry in terms of being able to take care of privations. And so, and this, and the, and the sneaky thing was, it, it wasn't as if there was a discussion of like, oh, this managed care sort of volume based sort of approach, which is fee for service that that's going to reconceptualize how we view physicians yeah. at your core. And that was not known to us at the time. Right. right. And that is exactly what has happened now. And now that that is the precedent, it's very hard to get that back. And so that would be what I would sort of point yeah. to. Now, the, the pandemic has led to some unique issues, but that was definitely uh, the central factor. Yeah. Okay. So there's a lot going on there. Um... So the, the first thing is like, so yeah, there's a fundamental change in, in the conceptual vocabulary and then that changes identities, uh, the identities of both the actors and of their actions. And then that undermines meaning for the physicians. And yet they're being expected to be sort of resources of meaning in some way to all these people who are coming in, uh, experiencing the meaning crisis and meaning scarcity. So <clears throat> one thing is, is it sounds... Uh, like the shift was a very much uh, a, a shift that represents sort of a, a fundamental kind of modal confusion um, that what w that fundamentally uh, and, and there's other people Han is talking about this when he talks about the burnout society and other things like that. Uh, there's, there's a reconceptualization of health and then there's a reconceptualization of what it is uh, to provide health or health care. Um, and so the, like the first thing, uh, we'll try some of these ideas on and see if they work. Um, one is, you know, Fromm's notion of a modal confusion, uh, that what we're doing is we're um, using the having mode where we're supposed to be relating to a transformation of a person. And that should be a, 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 a being thing, uh, a, a being event, a, a becoming event. Um, you're... you're transforming a person in a fundamental way um, and that should be inherently valuable and therefore it should be uh, from the being mode but everything is now in the having mode and you said it's commodified and so the sense of and I think you said like impact oriented the sense of connecting to people as entities that are inherently valuable has been undermined because you're put in a frame in which they are not treated and as entities that are inherently valuable. Is that part of it, right? Does that land for you? Does that sort of make sense? Yeah. I mean, I would say that, you know, healthcare for a lot of physicians w w was to be a sacrament. And, and now right. it's purely a contract. And when that <sighs> happens, that does shift the identities of not just the clinician, but of the patient. Yes, yes. Virtually no one include either of us in. And I think a lot of phys uh, patients, especially older ones, uh, who still have an idea of the sort of Marcus Welby, yeah. old school physician that's going to connect to you. And that's a good expectation to have get abruptly put on notice. No, this is in fact not what you get. And so then they get upset at providers not realizing that the reason you only have 10 minutes with your doctor is not because of our choice. That was a system that has been put upon us as well. Right. So we're both sort of bonded into this sort of decaying binary system. Yeah. And the reality is, is uh, unfortunately or fortunately, we're all going to need healthcare in some format. Yeah. You know, and so this is not something that could be ignored. I mean, if you're lucky and you, you know, you're an upstanding citizen, you you may never really need a lawyer, for example, aside from like wills or 
basic mm -hmm. financial or legal planning, but it's going to be hard unless you're exceedingly lucky that you'll ever go through most of your life without needing healthcare services. And so this ends up being something that consumes both of us, but suffices neither in terms of their meaning needs. You know, I wouldn't even know how to code that in a chart somewhere when someone is having a meaning issue that I feel is directly pertinent to their healthcare concern. Right, right. Like that, I mean, it cannot be coded if there's no ICD-10 code. ICD-10 is the billing system of nomenclature that is attached to medical claims so that they can be reimbursed. Then it doesn't exist. Okay, so if this then exists, and what do you do about it? This then moves to the deeper issue. The deeper issue of the conceptualization of health, which seems to be, I, I, I'm going to, forgive me, I'm just trying here, yeah. uh, right? It seems to be sort of a reduction of mechanically oriented suffering. Um, and then what we're trying to do is get rid of um, how this machine is not operating properly. Um, and then once we can do that, we're done with the person. And so health has been disconnected from well-being and um, meaning is itself not considered an important aspect of health unless it shows up in a breakdown of the machinery of cognition or something like that. Is that, I yes? I, I think that's exactly it. I mean, until it gets to the point where someone has a quantifiable mental health issue, it's, it's largely ignored. Right. And then, no way to address it. And so part of the problem is, right, there used to be there used to be institutions that that dealt with meaning issues for people. Uh, there was religious institutions. Um, and then there used to be uh, sort of semi religious institutions around therapy. But therapy is also being like psychotherapy is also being driven into this model. And the churches and the temples and the mosques and, and the and the sanghas are no are, are by and large not meeting this, and so it sounds like that means that everything is now being funneled into the the medical system that is precisely being designed to not deal with this issue. That's exactly it, and I think that I mean this might be branching a little bit, but I think that you know people have to put their faith in something otherwise they 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 wouldn't get out of bed and i think some people put it in technology as you know or yeah. um western medicine a lot of people go into all alternate routes i i don't think it's an i don't think it's a a coincidence and you you've spoken much more deeply about this than i than i have that you know psychedelics and plant based yeah. medicines uh, have, have yeah. a consciousness changing element to them at their core as as their essence yeah. i don't think it's an accident that that is taking off now people are searching for this oh definitely because we don't yeah. have a collective experience that brings that into their reality yeah right so we've lost the ancient meaning of health which was connected to wholeness uh and wholeness is typically uh understood uh you know in the ancient traditions it's associated with well-being uh you're trying to right um you're trying to live a fulfilled life, a, a life in which the whole person has come to uh, fruition in some fashion. So what, what, like, what do, do, what do you think is preventing the ability to, like, let me try this very carefully. There is a lot of good philosophical theory, because we are talking about moral issues and meaning issues, and a lot of good science separating meaning from mental health and from physiological malfunction. And why is that information not getting in to the medical field? Like, because, I, I mean, yeah. Like, a good, like, my initial response when you said, well, the doctors can't talk about it. I, I would want to say, well, why not? But there's a big difference between facing issues of meaning and, and existential connection and being debilitated in your ability to, uh, you know, do your profession. Um, like, the, I mean, you're, you're trading. Well, in one sense, you're not. But you're at least you're meeting people that are suffering deaths of despair. That, that's the, the 
meaning is a separate issue, at least to some significant degree from physiological malfunction or from, you know, serious mental disorder. This is, you know, it's not controversial to say that. I mean, uh, it might be controversial where you want to draw the boundaries. So I, I'm finding, a, I, I guess I want to understand why does all of this information not permeate into the medical profession? I mean, that's a that's a very challenging and, and excellent question. I mean, if I had to guess, I think one is uh, it may be fairly salient to experts such as yourself, this whole body of work that's sure. multidisciplinary. It, it really isn't in healthcare. Um, this just there are there are very few lectures. I, I didn't get a single lecture in med school on these larger issues of meaning making. Now I definitely had clinician leaders and attendings that, you know, would at the bedside teach me some of this, but that was entirely at their choice. And these were clinical pearls that were given episodically if there was a patient that merited that discussion. There was no systematic education about this. So that's that's number one. I think number two is that some physicians have accepted the reconceptualization of what they do. Most have not, but many have taken it on. Like, you know, it's not uncommon that some physicians will say that there was a whole Twitter discussion about this literally like a week ago. Physicians shouldn't be in the business of handling these larger issues. We are, in fact, just body technicians. When medicine was very close to tied to the roots of shamanism, you know, in, in the in the village community thousands of years ago, and there wasn't really much m medically that could be done beyond plant based derivatives yeah. of aspirin. Yes, we could understand that, you know, healing and spirituality were distinctly tied along with questions of meaning. Now we have too many things that we can offer medically for patients that are rooted in biochemistry and genetics and all the other sciences. And so some people have increasingly argued, and I think we have accepted as a class of professionals as de facto, that I guess this is just what it is, that this is all that we do, and that we really shouldn't be expressing ourselves beyond this. And I, I point to the, the third factor, look at some of the, the two central things, at least, and again, I'm, again, maybe arrogantly from a, an American perspective, but I've seen similar challenges in other countries, look at sex and death. These are, you know, birth and having a child, having sex, and then passing. The two central issues, physically at least, as well as mentally, emotionally, and meaning-wise, the most potentially meaning-laden events in people's lives, we treat them, and we are asked to treat them as professionals, as purely medical events and nothing more. And that has led to a gross problem in being able to address these things. In America, we have a society that denies death. Yes. You yes. obviously know extensively about that. Ernest Becker's book was fantastic in that regard. And his whole thing was what you've done, you know, world leading research and discussion on this sort of symbolic meaning making nature yes. and the biological one. We, we don't talk about it in healthcare. Most physicians, unless they're oncologists or deal with cancer a lot, like I do in intestinal diseases, or they're a palliative care doctor, they aren't trained to handle these larger issues and they're uncomfortable. So we are just sorely ill-equipped and we are not encouraged to handle that discussion. And then look at the flip side when there's a birth, which is usually a joyous thing, and the discussions around sex, equally vitriolic. Now there's more discussion about that, hyper-politicized, but at the same time, a lack of respecting the humanity of other individuals. Just right. like the dying person in front of you that's passing, that's a pronouncement medically. Okay, no pulse, no breathing, no neurological reflexes. That is a purely medical thing. No, that was a person. That is a yeah. person yeah. that is passing, that has a whole constellation of other things attached to that. But we aren't given the opportunity to get into some of that. And so with these two central pillars of human existence, I mean, just look at the news. Like we have a massive problem of, Million people have died as a result of the COVID pandemic in this country alone and millions more across the world. People argue actively, is the COVID pandemic even real or not in some communities? Yeah. Are these numbers real or are they fake? We still haven't had a real come to sort of public mourning aside from a couple yeah. of speeches 
about all this death as like, I mean, two, a million people have died in the last two yeah. years. Millions more have been permanently ill with long COVID and other long-term health complications. You, you'd think that we would all take a time out and pause and like, let's, let's bring in some yeah. experts such as yourself and let's, let's make sense of this. No, it's off to business as usual. And then look at the discussions that we're having about conception and birth. And obviously with political events in this country, that has gone on to record levels of extremism and and vitriol on both sides. So I, I think that, you know, in a, in a healthier medical industry or biomedical industrial complex, physicians would be equipped and given the opportunity to be able to bring some sanity into these discussions and then be able to pass the baton, proverbially speaking, to someone such as yourself and say, look, we're dealing with some difficult things right now. Let's bring in some experts who've dedicated their lives to understanding how to make meaning so that this isn't so scary for you, that this isn't mm -hmm. as confusing, and that you are then equipped with the skills to find out how you can make meaning of this. But that that hasn't happened. And I think it's, it's all these issues come together. And I think most physicians have this sense of like, there's a splinter in their mind. They're like in a dream they're trying to wake up from. Like something is fundamentally off about how we're doing care. All right. But they aren't able to verbalize it because they don't have the cognitive knowledge. They don't have the lexicon. Mm. And so they burn out and then they wonder why they're burning out. And there's some obvious risk factors, but then there's some non-obvious ones. And so that, that was to a certain degree, my journey as well. And, but mm. then I came across a lot of your work and some of your call. I was like, yes, this is a meaning issue. And this is the discussion that's not happening, even though this is the 800 pound grill in the room. And it's now leading to people not wanting to be in the healthcare field. And I'm truly worried for at least the American public. And I'm sure in other countries, like you're just not going to have enough caretakers. And if you do, they're not going to be fully engaged there. No, no. So you don't want a white coat. You want a person there in front yeah. of you crafting an experience with you to guide you through whatever health question you have that you can then take to your community and, and then elaborate from there. That That isn't really happening. And unfortunately, I don't see that happening uh, anytime soon. So that was a meandering answer to your question. No, it's a good answer. Uh, and I appreciate the passion um, and the commitment. I do know of a, of some, a couple of instances or more um, where psychiatrists have actually recommended my series to some of their patients because they've realized that their patients are encountering uh, an issue of meaning rather than you know uh, uh, you know just standard models of depression or anxiety or things like that. Um, I, I'm I, I'm I'm wondering. I mean, this is a delicate question, and if you like. I'll ask it, and and I'll, you, you can you can decide how specific or non-specific you want to be. But are the deaths of despair creeping into the medical profession itself? Are nurses and doctors moving towards this? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I I cite the statistic that I mean, roughly about four to five hundred physicians alone every year in the U.S. commit suicide. And there was actually, that's basically a med school graduating class every year, every year. And an average physician, depending on the nature of your specialty, will have probably about uh, a patient panel of probably anywhere from one to 3,000 patients. Mm. So if you do the math there, and then those are communities that, you know, are bereft along with the, 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 the family members of the people yeah. that commit suicide. So that, that's one. And then I don't know the statistics on nursing. Um, in fact, there was an ER physician who committed suicide at the height of the pandemic in New York and Joe Biden, you know, the current US president passed uh, a, a small measure, but it was a nice overture, uh, a law under her name, it may have been an executive order, sort of trying to emphasize the need for federal support and resources directed to clinicians. Mm -hmm. So this absolutely has permeated, there are definitely rates of substance abuse, not just burnout, professional lack of satisfaction, uh, and mental health challenges that are creeping in 
into the men into the into the well-being of you know the whole cohort of allied health professionals and it's it's become a real challenge and the healthcare industry writ large is concerned with like well who's going to see all these patients who's going to get through all this billing who's going to do all this charting the central question is like why are the healers not feeling healed and supported themselves yeah and what does that speak to the larger mission or lack thereof of what we're trying to do and it's only in the last few moments of this pandemic where i at least i get the sense that some organizations are finally starting to realize just how deep this problem goes because you know at least in the u.s we have sort of a sort of a complacency to crisis model of reaction to things like yeah, yeah. it has to get to a crisis level before anything would even be done about anything yeah otherwise we're completely complacent and that's obviously not a great way of handling things and i think that it may take the bottom to fall out before before we start having you know real issues here so uh, this is another vicious cycle the health professionals are driven into being body technicians. And then because they're body technicians, uh, a great number of them suffer a crisis of meaning. Um, uh, uh, and then, um, right, that is that it can lead to deaths of despair. And so they are incapable uh, as a profession of actually addressing the way their inattention to meaning is actually eating away at the very profession itself. Absolutely, I think that's in fact, absolutely it. So we talk about like physician reimbursement, autonomy, how you deliver the care. But I think at the root of it, those are all spokes off the central hub, which is this meaning. Yeah, crisis. yep, yeah. And, and I think, you know, there's a long history of you know, physician authors from Oliver Sacks to, you know, William Carlos Williams and other individuals, you know, and, and physicians and characters of literature, you know, death of Ivan Illich and all these sorts of, uh, you know, artistic an you know, antecedents, if you will. But there, there really hasn't for the most part in the modern era. There, there aren't these people both within the healthcare community and outside of it that that are able to sort of work and engage in these sorts of issues and i think part of it is also the media environment i mean we are oversaturated with just you know social media entertainment so many things competing for our attention as life is getting busier for everyone yes generalize that it becomes hard for you know, those prophets in the desert to get their voice transmitted. I mean, I, I was sort of like, when I came across your YouTube series, I was like, how is it that I've not come across this before? Because I'm, I'm certainly not an expert in any of the areas that you are in, but I'm sort of a, at least a interested general mm, citizen right. on these topics. But this, this just didn't, the algorithm didn't feed it to me. And I, I didn't even think that there would be a, I honestly was surprised that anyone would take this level of time and attention at length over what, like 50 episodes to provide this to the public i mean that's an, an enormous amount of effort and i can just congratulate you so much for that Thank that you. that is that is not something that would naturally occur that i would think an expert or anybody would really do that just seems like such a huge boulder to push but you pushed it and i think that kind of work needs to be transmitted further it, it's just sort of um when you come across something like that, you're like, of course, like, of course, something like this is needed, you know, where people can help us craft meaning. But before I knew about it, I didn't really even know what I was looking for. Right, right. And that is part of the connection problem with people who may have guidance and insight and counsel, such as yourself versus people that desperately need it. And because this is so shrouded and all the issues we've, we sort of have mm. elaborated on, that connection is not easy to make, you know? Right, right. That's very well said. I mean, is part of the problem that medicine has progressively crafted its identity as, as, as science and art and distinct, like you said, from 
any connection to a religious framework, right? Because it smacks of shamanism or superstition or magic. Yeah. And, and so the right. Um, and, and so any attempt to start talking about these is sort of thought uh, these issues is thought of uh, hearkening back to everything that medicine sort of pulled itself away from. I think so. And I think that that's an excellent point. And I think, I think that under wrote some of the controversies, at least in this country, about uh, recommendations for the COVID pandemic. Mm. Obviously, we had such intense controversy about masking, who should mask when, especially with school kids. When can school kids go back to school in person versus doing mm. lectures via Zoom? You know, when should there be public mandates on this, the vaccines? Now, I think that there were some notable missteps by public health bodies in the United States. But what I can do is at least say that there was an attempt, uh, however unsuccessful at times, to at least ground some of those recommendations based on studies and data and science. But this was a fast moving pandemic. It was a novel virus. Public health research is dramatically harder to conduct, especially in real time, yeah. versus traditional biomedical research, uh, yeah. which is why the, the solid, the most solid evidence basis for our interventions came with the the antivirals and the and the vaccines because that had been developed for decades. Really, mm -hmm. the other issues was where the controversy occurred. So, to your point, I think that a lot of public health bodies would have garnered more credibility with the American public. If they said, look, we do have data for this recommendation about elementary school kids masking or not masking, but we understand that this is also to a certain degree a values and meaning based recommendation. Yes, yes, yes. You know, and when parents were like, look, I'm worried that my child may not socially develop and that mm -hmm. that social connection is important yes. for them to be able to grow, you that that they were summarily dismissed as being sort of not relevant. And I thought that was not the message that needed to be sent. We needed to be able to say it's okay to make recommendations that are based on things that are not purely public health or medical, because obviously the art of judgment and discretion has to come in. But I think there was a fear on part of medical authorities that if we do that and we open those gates, exactly what you just cited is gonna be occurring that, well, then all of our recommendations are gonna be dismissed. None of it is valid. It's completely unscientific. And I understand that fear when we had some, frankly, pretty uh, awful conspiracy theories. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not the least yeah. by the former president of, about some of this stuff. You know, and so, you know, how, how do you raise your children? What kind of communities should be existing in an era of pandemic? I mean, this is something that our society was ill-equipped to address. Since it's been 100 years since this has happened. Now, if you look at the history of societies, which you know better than me, the presence of pathogens and germs have always been a central feature yeah, yeah, in yeah. all these societies, but we have been fortunate in the modern era that that isn't the case. So when it came to those larger questions, we we in the medical field didn't really honor those questions and their, their exactly. validity. Exactly. Because we didn't want to be felt like we were being pulled back to your point, but yeah. when we made that central error, we lost credibility. And then that is when we had massive politicization and, and the lack of agreement and that ended up the yep. very enterprise of responding to responding to the pandemic started breaking down and that was a meaning question that i don't think we addressed yep. at all yeah and, and 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 the conspiracy theories were emerging precisely because of the meaning issue and the domicile yeah. that people were experiencing they were they were articulating it poorly and then that like you said that made everybody no no uh, pure science none of the like and then they created a meaning vacuum and then the whole thing was doing yeah. this on itself i and agree it this sort of dipole system here yeah yeah and i think that that was probably for me and this may be an inarticulate way of saying it that was probably one of the big takeaways just writ large from your work when i was going through the series as much as i could pick up because obviously i this is not my area so i was like googling every other term you said like trying to keep <laughs> keep pace but i i mean it occurred to me that people will regularly violate their values in order to meet their needs. Mm -hmm. And the central need that you've pointed to is a need for meaning. That is a hardcore yes. central humanistic thing that is part of our existence. Yes. Yep. But we don't have a society and we certainly don't have a healthcare delivery system for lack of a better term 
that honors that. And yet this is supposed to be the most human of all professions. Yeah, and that is now come to a crescendo with all these sorts of challenges. And we're just totally bewildered and we're having fallout, fallout of patients, fallout of doctors, fallout of nurses. Uh, the general public is like not sure what to make of it. And, and the center is starting to collapse. And to your point, nature you know, doesn't like a vacuum. We need a new system to kind of take that place that is better. And I don't see a larger movement as of yet, maybe in Canada, it's a little bit different of that system kind of coming into place. Uh, and that is a problem. And I think that I don't know how that plays out. I really don't. So during the during COVID, uh, with my colleague and good, very good friend, Dan Chiappi, we read Camus' The Plague together, mm. where you get exactly the opposite, right? There's very, there's, I mean, they're doing what they can, uh, but it's clear that the, right the the plague is going to overtake them they have to quarantine they're doing everything they and it was so pertinent because the the whole point of the novel is is to first of all get people to like step back and uh, you know and the, and the main one of the main characters is a doctor and you know he's basically a stoic figure in the midst of this um and then there's other important figures helping him um and one of the figures uh taru um uh, it's very much this uh, one of my almost a personal slogan for me. He said, "I want to learn how to be a saint without God." That's the whole problem I'm up against these days. <laughs> yeah. So they they took they took this issue of people facing a pandemic. Well, Camus took it, I should say, and he makes the whole existential issue the central thing, because the point he is actually making, of course, is that we, we are always, in a sense, in a pandemic because we're always mortal. We're always facing this, and if we try and remove right the 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 treating of the ill from the fact that we are also in deeply moment by moment mortal um then we're we we are dehumanizing ourselves and so it's the way in which the heroes relentlessly will they will not let go of their humanity in the midst of the pandemic that i found such a contrast uh to what was going on um in, in sort of the the public space and the government led space which which brings up the issue of do you think it is and you already alluded to this do you think it is that the medical profession really i'm going to say this very boldly really is not dealing with life and death anymore it doesn't really i i don't mean life just as metabolism i mean life uh right right you know, bio, not just uh, Zoe, right? And, and 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 like you said, there's the whole attempt to deny that death, ha right, is there, and to treat it almost, I don't know, almost as a background phenomenon, or a, not acknowledge, as you said, how these two things are only livable for human beings if they're invested with some kind of meaning. And, and so what would it take like what what is needed is is like it it, it to, i mean this is going to be a ridiculous proposal but like uh do we do we need to get people in healthcare reading this kind of literature uh thinking more philosophically getting into deeper discussions about uh you know what makes a life worth living uh why is death and mortality uh, so challenging for human beings. How do we process it? I mean, there's a lot of literature out there on this. It, and again, it, it doesn't have to be new agey or woo woo. It's but it can be like really careful reflection. Um, like the main character, like he he's basically a stoic. He's an existential stoic hero. It's like is that? I mean, that to me that's a great work of literature. And one of the things you could ask is, well, is that how the doctors should have been behaving? Uh, during the pandemic, should have they have been exemplars of people mm -hmm. who are facing these challenging realities? And if not, then who should they be turning to in order to find the exemplification? Yeah, I, I actually don't think it's ridiculous at all. I mean, I, I was fortunate to take a couple of uh, classes as an undergrad in, in the literature of medicine and, and the sociology of medicine. I I mean, I was a bioethics major in college, so I, I mm -hmm. had a lot of sort of amateur philosophy training, but yeah, most, most 
colleges and certainly med schools don't really regularly offer that. Now that's changing. In the modern era, you'll have a couple of lectures or even a whole class as an elective. But I, I do think that this is going to be requisite. And the thing is, is that when you're early in your training in medical school, and certainly probably once you graduate, you're, you're rarely put in the position, if ever, where you're the sole provider of care for someone that is critically ill. Mm. And usually, not always, but you know, they're not going to put you in the ICU, the you know, first year of medical school to shadow senior doctors. I mean, they may. Usually, they'll start in an ambulatory clinic where the patients may have chronic health issues, but they're not dramatically ill. And then they kind of graduate you up as intuition might dictate so that you can kind of develop those skills. And that would be the opportunity where you could start having a sort of a, a curriculum built in. Yes. Where you could have these kinds of exposure. But the, the flip side is the, the return on investment, to use a medical business language, like will not be immediate. If you're a first year medical student, unless you've lost someone personally or you've had some close ties to death, all these discussions that I think are central that are needed about the mm. philosophy uh, and the central challenges of like, what is a good life and therefore what is a good death that may not have an immediate return in terms of relevance for a number of years. Right. So I, th I think the value proposition of this kind of work needs to be made. Now, if you're already in the trenches or you're already later in your career and you're dealing with this, I think when someone hears about like the work you're doing, they're going to get it like that. Mm. It's bringing to words something they've known in the background of their mind, but they couldn't verbalize. But earlier in training, you may need to explicate a little bit more distinctly, like this is why this is important because mm. you're going to be facing down the road challenges, it may not be a plague, it may not be a pandemic, where these skills and funds of knowledge are going to be directly relevant and that this is a skill as is doctoring. Like you're not gonna just read Death of Ivan Illich or The Plague or learn yeah. some Stoic philosophy and like, oh, you're set. Like, no, this is a discipline. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you're gonna to have to develop this skill and it's gonna be no less relevant than listening to heart sounds to make sure there's no murmur or whatever. And like that needs to be built in yes. uh, into yeah. that kind of curriculum, you know? During, during the Hellenistic period when there was uh there was domicide and a meaning crisis in the Hellenistic world, uh, a new metaphor emerged for the philosopher. The philosopher was the physician of the soul. But yeah. now, right, we, we it looks like we need to go the reverse. Yeah. Uh, we need to get the physicians uh, to, uh, to, to remember uh, th that, that function of, of healing the, healing the soul and not just healing uh, the body. I, I, I'm wondering yeah, I, I'm wondering what that would mean. I mean, it sounds like you're right. I don't think you get this just by reading. That's just propositional. You need uh, you need all the other kinds of knowing. Uh, you know, there, there would need to be, you know, an, an ecology of practices that physicians individually and collectively were participating in on a regular basis in order to address some of the, the deep deficits that you pointed out so eloquently. And there would need to be time and an opportunity to do that, um, which would be hard because inevitably, unless someone is very dedicated to this, that, that would take away some time from patient care. Like if your clinic or your workload is stacked from like, and most physicians are working at least 60 hours a week, if not yeah, more, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not including their own families and other things they got to do, you, you would need to take time away from that so they could process some of this. I mean, hearing you talk it, it reminded me it's not uncommon that i'll log into a chart on the computer for a patient that i had previously seen but no longer actively taken care of and then i'll get a pop-up you are now entering the chart of a deceased patient oh. because they got admitted to the hospital and they had sepsis which is a severe infection or a heart attack or what have you and and the healthcare system is so disconnected most of the physicians, unless you were immediately taking care of the patient at the time of death, you will not get notified of that. No. And it'll just be, a, but it'll be this sort of benign pop-up. And it's like, oh, this is so, uh, such a microcosm of this larger issue. Like we're not even notifying the community of providers that one of their patients just passed. 
Uh, and you don't get it unless you happen to look in the chart. And it's one of like 10 alerts that you get just to log into the computer. And I was like, wow, that is that is exactly the problem. The most central event in someone's life, arguably, is when they pass. And this is treated as a non-event that doesn't even merit discussion. And you're lucky if you even hear about it, let alone having right. an ecology of practices where you can like really get into this. And I'm not suggesting every patient that's critically ill with every provider needs this whole thing. But I think a regular part of someone's practice especially if you're in certain fields, you know, like oncology, cancer care or whatnot, this would be particularly relevant. And I think that yeah. there is a need for that. Yeah. 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 That makes, that makes really, that's a very good point. I get what you're saying though. The problem is initially you're not going to see the benefits of this. You're only going to see it long-term where, yeah. you know, uh, the, the, uh, the unacknowledged depression and anxiety and, uh, you know, uh, forms of addiction and deaths of despair that are chewing away at the medical profession and the quiet quitting. There's a yeah, lot of exactly people, a but, great right, term. Yes. Right. And so where we, you know, you. This is this, this this requires leadership because the market is not oriented towards these long term goals of meaning. And, and, no, right. Yeah. And so we should like. We need, this is where political leadership has to, you know, really take a stand and say, no, 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 right? If we if we keep doing these short-term measures, we're actually sacrificing our healthcare system um, long-term. The doctors are going to be overwhelmed by the disease that they're trying to treat, but not properly trained or prepared to treat. I 100% I agree. And you know, for a lot of your listeners that are well versed in the work that you do, it may seem obvious that this is clearly needed, but this, for the most part, really isn't spoken of in any real length. I mean, there'll be a class here or there. I'm not saying there's no discussion on it, but as a regular part of certainly practicing physicians, certainly not. And the example I give is I remember when I took like an astronomy class or I had a lecture in high school. And we were looking at the stars at night with a telescope. And for the life of me, I, I struggled to see the big and the little dipper and, you know, all the other constellations that were out there. And I, someone had to like kind of almost point it out and they took like a picture book and like, this is what it's supposed to, do you see it there and orient your tele? And I, for whatever reason, really struggled to see the pattern. Once it was pointed out to me and I practiced it, I was like, oh, now I can't help but see it. Right. When I look at the night sky and I'm in like the right part of the country and whatever. And it's sort of like that, like there's this whole constellation of, you know, experts in cognitive science and philosophy and sociology and artists and literatures and philosophers, like all that have dedicated in their own disciplines or cross disciplinary to making meaning mm. and learning the skill set of how to create, create that meaning that has been established for thousands. I mean, this has been the work of civilization all that has been disconnected from the core of medicine. And so it seems obvious to a lot of your listeners. It really isn't. Sure. So yeah. we are the people looking out. We don't really see the Big Dipper. And now this wave of suffering is not only overtaking our patients, it's pushing people who are right. good people out of the field. And it, it almost have to be like a variety of not only political leaders, but thought leaders. Yeah, yes. This, yeah. to the attention and maybe even frankly dumbing it down a little bit because we we don't have the bandwidth to go deep into like you know the pre-hellenistic roots of all this sort of stuff but like at least as an intro be like look there's a body of knowledge that's been created by a variety of people that can really help you and yeah. let's create some classic examples practically that make it relevant for people who are taking care of patients this is why this is relevant for you and you don't need to wait until there's a real crisis with one of your patients or when you're really dealing with this stuff if you see how useful this is i think you're going to see a lot of people naturally gravitate towards this much earlier in this training and i know that the modern medical students of, of the current generation that reach out to me for guidance and mentorship and application help and whatnot they're on this on a level that that i wasn't even and i had some exposure to this 
part of it has become the pandemic because they're like, you know, 20 year old kids, 22, 23, 24, yep. for the most part, they're ready to go into medical school, but they're seeing all this and they're like, wow, what a, yep. you know, I'm not going to cuss on your podcast, but what a disaster some of these elements of the, of the pandemic response has been. And they, they don't want to repeat the same mistakes and nor should they. And they're yeah. reaching out and they're way savvier about some of this stuff. So I think that's my hope is that they're going to be much more receptive and engage, willing to engage on the work that you and other leaders in this area have done. And that, that gives me an ability to feel slightly less anxious about this and that the future can actually be redeemed for, for good. Well, I work with somebody specifically who is like, you know, doing PhD in medicine and going into being a physician, but she is uh, deeply interested in uh, the issues around the meaning crisis and awakening from the meaning crisis for exactly the reasons uh, you're talking about. Um, so I, it, it, it sounds like it's a matter of encouraging and educating uh, this most recent generation so that they can make it accepted that physicians in general can talk about this and seek the kind of training of skills and and virtues that are needed in order to uh, tip the balance back the right way again. So we're not, it, we're I, I, like the way you've described it, we're in this sort of death spiral and we've yeah. got to get out of this. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, it sounds fairly soon or the system's going to be irretrievable it's good we're gonna you know there's a point where it, systems like that you pass the knee and the curve and then yeah you, you can't intervene in them anymore you just have like the Ro the western roman empire just falls right there's yeah and kind of thing um i mean i think the only reason that there has been more of an issue than there ha already has been is that we still have an influx of med school applicants. I mean, med school applications increased by like almost 20% in the first year and a half of the pandemic because I mean, they called it the Anthony Fauci effect because people wanted to sort of mimic this sort of physician hero conception. Again, a question of meaning, like this is how yeah. I'm gonna do my job. Yes, yes. What they don't know is that one of the reasons Dr. Fauci is so lauded in most but not all circles is uh is how exemplar but how much of an outlier he is that is not an opportunity afforded to most patients or yeah. most young physicians but the other thing is that you still have record numbers of applications yeah and then depending on immigration policy you have foreign trained physicians coming in so the system is like well we can turn out more doctors it'll take a long time but like we have an influx so we don't really care if the current physicians are spewing out with all these meaning related health issues now when the influx of new providers drops, then you're going to start really yeah. seeing health systems start panicking. Like, oh, we should have been paying attention to this a lot earlier. Yeah. Uh, Rusha, this has been very uh, uh, educational for me. I hope I was helpful back to you because you were certainly teaching me a lot. Uh, no, I, this was great. I, I love talking to people that can kind of take my verbal diarrhea and kind of really make it centralized. And I, I, I would just encourage you and all of your colleagues that are in this area, there is a huge class of, of people around the world. I know I've referenced America quite a bit, but uh, that are in healthcare professions and not just physician, physicians, but, you know, allied health professionals writ large that are dealing with this issue and, and with the few educators who are not in healthcare that I've talked to, you know, teaching at various levels, obviously, you know, teaching much better than me. I'm hearing somewhat similar stories, like people yeah. who are in these central social service fields. Uh, this is a huge area where meaning is, is not theoretical, this meaning challenge. Like yep. this is, immediate, I agree. Yeah. it is very, very relevant. So I encourage everyone to see how you could help those who are trying to help others because I think there would be a lot of avenues for for integration for the work that you know you all do with the people that could really hear it yeah that seems like a very good place to end it with that call to action so I wanted yeah. to thank you very much uh for coming uh for those of you who are watching this uh, I'm also going to go on uh, uh Rusha's podcast and uh we'll tr try and you know, get this message out. So I'm looking forward to that. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Professor. It's been a real pleasure. Please call me, John. And thank you very much. All right. Thank you.